We're so excited to conclude today uh, our series, It's Just a Phase. And the reality is, is there's so many different phases in our lives. I, I, think, I think if you were to look back at your life, those of you who are maybe a little older, if you were to look back at your life, you can kind of name some phases that you went through, some things that you experienced, some moments in your life that were really significant, some that maybe weren't so significant that you remember. But I think we would all agree with the same kind of idea that <clears throat> those phases shaped who we were or who we are. Those phases that we experienced began to be kind of like a catalyst uh, to kind of shape and mold us and to be, to be the person that we are today. And that we've learned a lot from those phases. And so our whole idea from this message series is, is, is a couple things. The first thing is that we want our church, we want all of us to be people who are focused on being intentional in relationship uh, with our students and children who attend this, uh, attend this church and in our community. That was our first hope. We wanted our church, for you all, to be aware that you play a significant role in the lives of the, of the youth and the children of this community today. And we also wanted parents to know that they have a church, that they have a people, that they have this huge group of people who are willing to back them, who are willing to support them, to give them what they need in order to help raise their young uh, children uh, to be the young men and women that God has created them to be. It's biblical, it's in scripture in Deuteronomy 6, and it's our job as a church together to raise these kids. And so we wanted to bring awareness of that, but we also wanted to bring awareness that all of us go through phases and all of us experience different things. And it's our job, I think it's so important for us to be uh, uh, kind of thinking about the phases of our lives that we're in right now and how it is that we can make some significant impact in people's lives. I think most of us, as Americans, we kind of live haphazardly. We don't really have a plan. We don't have some sort of set structure, structures or systems. But I think God is calling for us to take our lives seriously and to be intentional with our lives. And whether it's in the workplace, whether it's at home with your kids, whether it's at a church building, wherever you are in your system, wherever you are in your life, you are called to be intentional and you are called to help shape people's lives. And we're gonna look at some scripture that proves that today. But I just wanted to, to, to let you know that. And so let's do a little recap to kind of catch us all up because I know there's some people here today who have no idea what we're talking about who haven't been here. Or perhaps there's someone who's watching on the website or online now that hasn't seen what we're doing. So let's do a quick recap. So the first thing, and it's not gonna be on this, I forgot to put it up there, but there's 936 weeks between birth and graduation. And so the book that we're basing this series off of, this curriculum that we're basing this series off of, uh, helps us to name that there's only 936 weeks, and it's our job as a church and as parents to be intentional with those 936 weeks. Because as the writer James in scripture says, that time goes like that. Wow, my snap is way louder than I thought it was gonna be. I thought it was gonna be like, that's how fast it goes. It's a mist. 
Life is quick, and the phases that your kids are going through is super quick as well. And so the thing that we've kind of been pushing, or at least that I have been pushing, and I'm hoping that you are taking serious, is that you have a responsibility, and your job is if you do not step up, the youth and of this next generation, they will step out. And there's proof behind that because the millennial generation has done it. The generation that is in between, born in 1980 to 1996 or something like that, that generation for the most part has statistically left the church. And it is our job to say, you know what, we do not want that to continue to happen. And maybe we, we can probably get some of those back, but we need to be more intentional focusing on the next generation too. So we have to step up. We absolutely have to. This isn't something that we're suggesting you do. This is something that I believe scripture is telling us to do. We have to do something because I believe, and I hope that you believe that a relationship with God can change someone's life and point them into a direction where there's an eternity that is good. See, it's not just about the temporary life that we live here. And so we have to be people who are willing to be mentors, to be teachers, and to be people who will step up so this next generation doesn't step out. And so we can continue uh, helping people to understand that the relationship with God and the church have a significant role in who we are and who we are becoming. So if you don't step up, they will step out. The next thing we talked about is uh, our job as, a pa- as, uh, as leadership, uh, as people who volunteer, and as parents, is we have to do a couple things. We have to keep presenting, translating, and creating experiences until they, meaning the youth of the next generation, uh, they've learned what they need to know. It's our job to do that. It's our job to keep communicating to them. It's our job to to tell scripture in in a different way, to give it different meaning, to give it different context. It's our job to help kids to have adventures and experiences. It's our job to do things like VBS, where we do this crazy thing called shipwreck, and we change this church building uh, into like this big old boat where 200, 300 kids are able to come in and say, wow, I've never seen anything like this before. And what is going on? And they say, hey, mom, dad, did you see what that church is doing when I went to VBS and yeah they taught me some great things but just the appearance of it looked awesome and it was so cool and I just I learned about this guy named Noah I learned about this guy named Jesus I learned about these disciples and it starts a conversation because experiences create energy energy creates conversation and conversation I believe starts as as the uh, catalyst for conversion It's it's the catalyst to drawing people in to relationship with God. And kids have such vivid imaginations, vivid imagination. They're they're so creative. And we have to be people who can kind of channel that inner kid inside of us and reimagine and rethink and and say, what if we told a story that's biblically, biblically accurate, but in a way that just challenges kids to say, I'm interested in that. And they can talk to their parents and it just becomes this cycle of just communication and love and experience that draws people to the loving arms of Jesus Christ. It is our job, church. It is your job, individual. It is your job to be a part of a change that helps kids experience who God is. And we can't just do it once. We can't volunteer one time. We can't volunteer. We can't just say something one time. We have to keep doing it. We have to keep doing it. It's just like sports or band. You don't get good at it unless you practice. And so you have to practice and you have to get yourself engaged a little bit more. That's our job as a church. And I'm not just talking to you, I'm talking to yours truly as well. You two are sliding down, it's weird. Next slide. Uh, make them feel, I, I'm sorry, that's, they're my youth group kids and it's, it's, it's a bad thing, I shouldn't do, be doing that. Make them feel significant by giving them something significant to do. Have you ever had a young kid that you just said, hey, I want you to do this, like Jocelyn loves to help. And so I always say, hey Jocelyn, hey, can you take out Addie's poopy diapers? And that's for, for her, if you ask her what she's most excited about for this new baby, it's just so weird, but she says, I'm excited for him to poop because she is like, this is weird. I don't understand. She is longing to change his diaper. That's what she wants to do. I don't know why. And I'm like, go ahead, kid, have fun. Uh, and I'm, whatever she wants to do. And, and so she feels like that's something significant. And you should see when, when we include her into something that us as parents are doing, that really is in our minds kind of insignificant, but for her, it feels significant. She is, she becomes so engaged and so excited to be able to be working with her parents. What if, what if the church did something that was so significant and gave the youth of this next generation the ability to be a part of something bigger than themselves? 
What if the church continually cared less about the politics part and cared less about the traditional part, cared less about those kinds of things and began to be a church that cared more about how we can in, uh, um, uh, interestingly, intriguingly uh, engage the youth of this next generation and say, hey, listen, you have a role to play and this is the thing we want you to do. What if the youth, this is gonna sound so silly, but I remember when I was in seventh, I was in seventh grade, my church in my hometown, they asked me to be an usher. I was like, I don't even know what that is. What, is, what do you ush? What is, what is that? How do you do that? And they were like, hey, we want you to be an usher. And they gave me like this little name tag. And I was like, I have a name tag. I'm important. I, and I would like stand at the church like this. Hey, I'm Chance. Welcome. Just do silly stuff like that. But it made me feel engaged. It made me feel like I was important. And so what if we just became a church that did things like that, where we just engaged our children and youth and we allowed us to all work together because we are the church now of today. And so it's so important for us to realize that we need to give our youth, to give our children, and even ourselves, let's be honest, ourselves, something significant to do because it helps us to feel significant. That's, that's so interesting in, in, in the church. I think that's something that we, we should be so interested in, rather, as a church, that we should begin to be thinking of creative ways to draw people in. Jesus did that all the time. He really did. I mean, why do you think Jesus told so many stories? I'm sure he was a good storyteller. I'm sure people were like, what is this guy talking about? But Jesus knew what would capture people's hearts. Jesus knew what would draw people to him. Jesus knew how to do that. And now we're not perfect by any stretch of the imagination, but what if the church started reacting and emulating what Jesus did and began to be people who were just like, you know what, let's be creative here. And then we don't want to lose this next generation. We want to be so intentional with reaching them because we want to help them to see that there is an eternity for them, that God has planned for them, that will change their lives and the direction of their lives forever. And here's the fun thing, I, and I'm going to say this and I love saying this, we get to do that. You you get to be a part of that. You don't have to be a part of it. You get to be a part of it. And when your perspective changes of, oh, I, have, I just have to volunteer one more time. I have to do this thing one more time. It, you know, the, the people I experience most, and I'm just gonna speak from my own experience. When I volunteer because I feel like I have to, I am not the best volunteer. I'm an aggravated jerk, probably. Some of you probably might have experienced that. But when I volunteer in moments where I, I feel like, you know what, I get this opportunity. I get to be a part of this, this big thing that's bigger than myself. It allows for me to experience happiness. And so what would happen in your heart if you just said, I get to be a part of this. I'm 88 years old, but I get to be a part of a youth's life. Or I'm 22 years old and I just graduated college and I don't know what I'm doing, but I get to be a part of this. I get to volunteer in Sunday school. I get this opportunity to play in the band or to speak on stage or to be an usher or to do many different things. I get this opportunity. And so I'm hoping that you hear in my voice and I'm hoping you hear in my tone that we have an opportunity here. We really do. And we simply cannot waste it. That is my hope and my prayer for you and for me. And so what I want to do for the next few moments is I just want to break down the six main stages that uh, this book talks about. And if you've ordered the book or if you read the book, it's really interesting. But there's, there's major milestones, as the book calls it, uh, that helps us to name and to understand what kids are thinking and what they're going through. And so I'm going to kind of go through these quickly, but I hope that you write these down or at least think about them. Because there's an important tone here that what we're going to talk about. And then we're going to jump into some scripture that I think will help us to understand this a little bit better. But there's some major, six major things that kids go through that we need to be a part of. And the first thing is this, the beginning. Kids have a beginning stage. The zero to three mark is the most important stage of a kid's life. Did you know that? The zero to three mark is where the most neurons are firing, the most growth takes place, the most uh, experience happens. They're looking for things, they're growing, they're understanding, they're learning boundaries and barriers. They're kind of understanding how this world works. And so as a church, we have to understand this, but for those of you who are parents or grandparents and you have kids who are in this age range, you need to know that as well. This is probably the most critical time of a kid's life, the zero to three mark. You help shape their personality, you help shape how they view the world, you help shape them, uh, help them to understand what love is and what compassion is. That is a super huge milestone. But with the book names, and I love this, those things are very, very important. And so I think for the most part, only the things that parents can do. But here's what the book names, and it really convicted me, really challenged me. <clears throat> Excuse me. For the most part, 
People have their kids baptized in this age range. Usually it's infants. Now some kids are baptized in order, and well, I know there's different views on that, but for the most part, kids are either baptized or dedicated, uh, in particular in the life of the church at this age. And you know what that communicates to the parents and to the kid? That not only at home do they have people that love them and support them and care for them, but at church, at the gathering of people, there's a group of people who will stand behind them and who will love them and encourage them and say on behalf of their baptism or dedication that I will support you, child, and you, family, in the growth that you're going to experience in life. We will stand with you. The church gets to play that role. We get to play that role with our kids. And James McGuire, and he's, or Jim McGuire, he, he is one of our ushers, and he does a lot of different things. And the other day, about three or four weeks ago, uh, my daughter Jocelyn was, I talk about her all the time because she's crazy. Um, my daughter Jocelyn was running around back there, and she's usually pretty shy at first. She gets that from her father. Um, but Jim is back there, and he's this big guy, and uh, he's, like a, he's like a teddy bear. He's so nice and so gentle. And one day, Jade and him just had a conversation, and he took a moment. This, this, is, so, this is so important. He took a moment to, to play with my daughter for a second. And he just did this, ah, just that. And instantly, she followed him around like he was her dad. She followed him, she was grabbing his legs, she was chasing him, she was playing with him. And you know what, the, what struck me about that? Is that, and I was just reading this book, is that he did something for her at this stage. And it was a simple moment where he just pretended to play with her and he just went, ah, that's all he did. And it changed how she viewed him. And every week she goes to him now. And she loves him. And it's, it's just an interesting thing. And Jim's here all the time. And now he hasn't been here for the last two weeks. He's been on vacation. And so this, week, this morning was kind of interesting to see how they interacted. But the thing is, is he took moments to do this because I don't think he realized what he was doing. But unintentionally, he stepped up and he's influencing the beginning stages of Jocelyn's life that she knows that this place she calls Crossfire, Crossfire is a place where she feels safe and she feels like she belongs because he stepped up just for a moment. What would it look like for you to be able to do that in someone's life? The beginning stage is so important, but as a church, as a church, it's where we declare to a family for the most part that we will stand behind them in their darkest times and their good times and to be able to support their family in any way that we can. The next stage, super important, is the wisdom stage, the four to 12. I, I call this the know-it-all stage. Does anybody have any know-it-alls? No one has any know it I heard a little murmur, but I have a, your know-it-all. Uh, know-it-all, the know-it-all stage is, is so much fun, but the, this age is like formal schooling, and so kids begin to be taught, they begin to be educated, they begin to understand more broadly out of the context of their home, but now they're in a context with a group of their peers. Uh, and I know some kids go to preschool earlier than this, and that's fine, but for the most part, in this stage, kids are beginning to understand a whole new world. And so they're growing in their wisdom, they're growing in how things work, they're growing in understanding that this person has this temperament and this person has this temperament and they have this temperament and so how do I interact with all of those people and so they're growing they're growing in this kind of formal education they're being stretched beyond their imagination they're given the tools the freedom and the creativity to dream about who they are called to be and so it's so important for us to realize that if you have a child or a grandchild in this stage here's what you need to know Here's what we need to know as a church, that this is the age where parents in the church have the biggest opportunity to explain, to name, to share with their growing youth, to share with their kids what their hopes and dreams and desires are for that child. It's the moment where you can say to them, I know that you are going to be something amazing. I know that you are going to do great things, whatever you do. I know that you have a, a plan for you that God has for you that is good, that is, is pleasing to him. God has something in store for you. It's that moment where we can shape and teach them. They're learning at school, and so their minds are open to this kind of bigger, broader thinking. They're gaining this wisdom outside of I want or my toy or my own little world, my own little family, and they're looking beyond themselves and they're willing and ready to be shaped because they don't know what they want to be, but you see as parents what they want to be. 
Tim Goodman, one of our pastors for now, uh, what he does, he does so, so well. Uh, he talks about his daughter, Maddie, and I love what he always says about her. He looks at her and he says, my daughter, Maddie, she is just kind. She is a kind, kind soul. She has a compassionate heart. She just loves people. She just, she has empathy. She just uh, uh, feels what other people feel. And he names that to her all the time. And he tells her, Maddie, you were just so kind. You were so kind. This is the important thing. And we're not going to know that they're going to be a police officer or they're going to be a pastor or they're going to be an astronaut. Those are just fun, creative things. But what you can do is begin to shape their character. They're willing to learn at this stage. And what could you do that uplifts their soul and say, hey, I see this in you. I've noticed this in you. And this is what you are good at. I love this about you. Essentially, they're in this know-it-all stage, but we can be thinking of it as this is our moment to give them encouragement. It's the encouragement stage. Very interesting. Very, very good for us to learn. The next one. It's a faith stage. Now, this is the stage that the church, I believe, should and does uh, play the most important role. Because about the age of 12 to 13, and sometimes in some cases 14, kids are beginning to, to have gone through all the Sunday school stuff. And generally speaking, Sunday schools end about sixth grade. Uh, they end about this age, and so they're kind of out of the Sunday school thing. And now what they're able to do is, because they've grown, because they've gained a bigger and broader perspective of the world, because they've been challenged in their faith, uh, they begin to have an opportunity where they can make their faith their own. See, as parents and as, as a church, it's our job to kind of coach them and to give them a bigger vision, to tell them uh, the stories of what Jesus did and try to help them make it their own faith. But they're not really able to mentally capable, uh, be, uh, they're not able to mentally be capable of doing that until they've reached about this age of their growth and development. And so this is such an important stage. And I think it's, it's why our church does this thing called confirmation uh, at this age range, at seventh, sixth, seventh grade, eighth grade, because what we're trying to do is to teach them a little bit more and be more intentional with telling them about faith and giving them better understanding and experience, but then it allows for them to name for themselves their own faith. It allows for them to, to name for themselves their own understanding of who God is and what they believe and what they don't believe. It's the prime time for them to wrestle with who they are. Now, I know we wrestle all of our lives, but this is the moment, is probably the most formative if the church and if parents are being very, very intentional with their kids. This is the moment where we can say to our children, hey, I want to challenge you to understand who God is. And here's the thing. They're probably going to ask you questions that you do not know the answer to. And here's your job. You ask somebody else, not me. Um, I'm just kidding. You can ask me, send questions to the church. Let us help you. Jamie has this curriculum uh, that she uses for her Sunday school teachers. It, and that, on that, uh, it's just a phase wall. There's resources to help us answer some of those tough questions that kids ask. And, and so it's our job to help them to be able to own their own faith. But more importantly, mom and dad, talking to you parents, mom and dad, this is the moment, this is the stage where kids observe how their parents lead their own spiritual lives. They watch their parents and what they do. Does my parent pray? Does my parent read scripture? Is my parent involved in owning their own faith? Does my parent go to church on Sunday? Does my parent believe that God exists? Does my parent uh, do uh, different things that, uh, that are involved in the church? Do they go on mission trips? Do they tithe? What, what do they believe? Kids are watching you and learning from you. And so parents, this is kind of hard, but parents, if you are not intentional in the faith stage, you will help, you're gonna directly or indirectly shape how kids view church and view life and view faith if you do not be more intentional. And so this is the moment where the book, how the book names it is that the spiritual practices that you do and that you may be doing as a family together will help shape them for their future, spirit, future spiritual practices in the future. Essentially, what you're doing as a parent in your own devotional life will reflect how your child does their own, uh, d does their own devotional life and how they are shaped and how they view the world. It begins that transition of, this is what my parents do, and so I'm owning it myself, and now this is what I am going to do. So parents, uncomfortably so, but I think it's important for you to know, you have to show them, and you have to model them for them what it looks like to be someone who's in a relationship 
with God. It's a tough job, but it's the best job. I love doing it, and I think that you will too once you get some coaching on how to do that, and we want to provide that for you. But this is such an important stage for our youth. The next stage. I think there's three more left. Identity stage. This is the stage that scares me the most. Um, 15-year-old girls, 14-year-old girls, and trying to figure out their lives and, and dating and relationships. I have two girls, and I'm like, oh, I don't know anything about this stuff. And so I have to learn. But this is such an important stage. Too. I, they're all important. They're all important. But this is a stage that's so important because it, this is where they begin to, to not only claim their faith, but to, be, uh, to claim their identity. Who they are deciding to be in this moment is most likely who they are going to be in the future. Are they going to be someone who is loving? Are they going to be someone who is not so loving? Are they going to be someone who, who picks fights? Are they going to be someone who bullies? Are they going to be someone who uh, makes a lot of bad choices? Are they going to be someone who, who influences people? Are they going to be leaders? Are they going to be followers? This is a, a super important moment in a, in a teenager's life. Uh, this is like the ninth to 10th grade moment where they're being challenged. Uh, uh, statistically speaking, ninth and 10th grade are the hardest grades for all students, especially girls. Uh, but the ninth and 10th grade is the hardest stage because they are not quite old enough to be in control of their life, but they are old enough to understand kind of what they want to do. And so this begins to help uh, them to understand, do I follow my parents' rule? Do I not follow my parents' rule? Do I do my own thing? Do I do their thing? And this is such an important phase and it's such an important stage that we have to be uh, kind of observant of, we have to be taking into account, that we have to help them to understand what good choices are and what bad choices are and help explain why those things are good and why those things are bad. This is probably one of my favorite chapters to talk about because it helps name uh, that kids are seeking their identity at this stage. They're seeking to be who they want to be in the future. And again, we get to play a role in their lives and helping them to understand who they are. Next stage. Two, two more left. The freedom stage, 16 to 17. Giving the kids the keys. Teaching them freedom. Saying, hey, listen, you know what you want now. And now that you've gotten your license, now that you, you have the keys to the car, and now that you can drive uh, certain days and certain times, and uh, now you have more freedom to make decisions, here's the keys to the car. Uh, kids, this is your freedom to go. Kids love this stage. Do you remember when you were 15, 16 years old and you had your license? Do you guys remember that? How many remember your first drive by yourself? I remember mine. I loved it. I was like in the car singing, yeah, I'm free, free falling. I'm just kidding. Uh, Tom Petty, never. Thank you, whoever, I'm a terrible singer, so. Uh, and so the thing is, is kids are experiencing freedom for the first time, but they're experiencing freedom outside of what their parents can watch and see, because honestly, parents, we can't see what they're doing all the time. And so this is such an important role, such an important moment for you as parents and as the church to help them to understand that there's consequences to decisions, consequences that are good, consequences that are bad. And so you have been given this small bit of freedom to go do X, to go to the grocery store for me, or to, to go pick up something for me, or to go hang out with your friends for a little bit. You have been given this small piece of freedom, but I need you to know, son, I need you to know, daughter, that with that small piece of freedom, there is positive things that can come out of this and there is negative things that can come out of this. It's our job to help them to understand that there are boundaries because kids live in the moment. They live off adrenaline. They live off the excitement of being free. And so we have to remind them, keep coaching them, keep teaching them that even though they have some freedom, there's consequences both ways, a good and negative, uh, that they need to be aware of and they need to be thinking of at all times. That's the freedom stage. And the last stage is, uh, is another good one. It's the graduation stage, and that's kind of where a lot of people are today. Uh, graduation season's just around the corner, or some of you have already graduated. Um, and this is a, a stage where they get to just go. They're, they're kind of really free. They're going to college, uh, or they're going into work, or they're doing whatever. Most kids start to begin to move out and transition out, uh, and they're beginning to get more freedom and more control over their lives. And parents, at this point, in church at this point, we don't have much say over what they do. We don't have much control over the decisions that they make. But here's what you can do. You can retell their story. You can remind them of each of the phases that you've experienced with them. Graduation parties are so awesome because uh, you may not realize this, but kids love to see themselves. They love to see their own pictures. They love to see themselves having fun. They even love looking at memories. I remember when I was a kid, my mom was making scrapbooks of my football career, my childhood, and all these things. I'm like, Mom, this is silly. Stop doing this. And now I get to her house, and I'm like, let's look at this scrapbook. I want to see what happened. Uh, and the thing is, is kids love that, and they forget. 
they forget where they've come from. They forget some of those exciting moments. They remember a lot of the bad moments, but they forget the good. It's easy for us to forget the good. And at this graduation stage, this freedom stage, it's our job to remind them, hey, this is where you came from. And do you remember this silly story when you did this? And man, that was a good experience. Do you remember that boat trip? Or do you remember that day at Kennywood? Or do you remember that day you scored a touchdown? Or the day that you were in this concert? Or that you got the lead in the, in the musical? Do you remember those days? That was so much fun. Do you remember the time that you threw up and on stage at a, a chorus concert and it was so funny but disgusting at the same time and I was so embarrassed? Do you remember when you threw a temper tantrum in the middle of a giant eagle and your parents, were like, I just walked away from you and let you cry and said that you were someone else's kid? Do you remember that funny time? Some of you are laughing because you've probably done that. Uh, and here's the thing, it's that moment to retell the story. It's the moment to remind them that you love them and that you see them and that you remember who they are. And it gives them that energy and that encouragement to be the people that God has called them to be. And so you're probably asking yourself this question, what do you do with it? As a church leader, next slide, as a church leader and as a parent, what do we do with this information? What do we do with this idea? What do we do with knowing these stages? What do we do with kind of understanding uh, where, where our kids have come from and what are we doing? And so I think we play an important role. I think our role though is to understand that we are not always going to get this perfect. We are not always gonna have it all together. We are not always going to have it all figured out and that we are going to make plenty of mistakes. But as a church and as parents, the thing is, is kids are durable. Kids, kids can take some things and they can have bad experiences. And it's our job not to get everything right, but it's our job to do everything we can in love. It's our job as a church and as parents to do everything we can to encourage, to love, and to support our youth in growing. And so there's an interesting moment in Scripture, interesting moment in Scripture where the Pharisees are beginning to ask Jesus some questions. And Jesus does something really interesting. They basically ask Jesus a question to say, hey, you know all of these things. You know, if you're, you're claiming to be God. You know all this stuff. Can you tell us what is the most important thing that Scripture has to say? And it was, it was a tricky question. But they ask him this question. And Jesus does something with this that is really, really, really Remarkable. And so here's what it comes to in Matthew. Can you go to that, that slide? Are we there? Oh, there it is. Oh, just go ahead, skip that. Go ahead. There you go. So this is a really interesting verse. It's one of my favorite uh, parts of Scripture at all time. And Jesus says in Matthew 22, one of them, being uh, the Pharisees, who was an expert in the law, meaning they knew what they were talking about. They knew what they were doing. They were professional. He tested him with this question. Teacher. Which is the greatest commandment in the law? The, the Pharisee here, he was baiting Jesus. Because essentially what the Pharisees believed is that because all scripture, all truth, or because all, everything that was in the, their scriptures well, it was equally important, they believed that everything uh, was equally true, they believed that it was always equally important. And so they were having this really rough conversation of, Jesus, what's important and what's not important? Can you give us a little more direction uh, of what we should be thinking? And what they were trying to get Jesus to say is, hey, all scripture is equally important. All scripture is equally important. And Jesus says, listen, I want to break the rules a little bit here. I'm going to tell you something that might set you off a little bit. And essentially what Jesus is about to say is he said, yes, all scripture is equally true. All scripture has equal value, but not all scripture is equally important. He says, I want to flip you, uh, what you believe upside down a little bit. I want to change the way you're thinking. And this is what Jesus says to him. And I love this. And he says, uh, Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart Oh, sorry, with all, yeah, with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. This is the first and the greatest commandment. I want you to love God with everything that you have. And the Pharisees would have been like, okay, that's not exactly what we've been taught because there's like 622 laws. And so it's really hard for us to kind of boil down which one's important. But I, I guess I can, I, can, I can go with that. I, I guess that this makes sense. I guess that we're supposed to love God because uh, that's kind of what he wants us to do. But then Jesus says, this is the part that's gonna kind of make you a little nervous. And then he says, go ahead to the next one. I know it's laggy. And the second is like it. The second is like it. And what he would have been saying is that these are like, equally important. So all those 600 things, those are important, but these two are the most important. And they would have been like, what? And he said, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. 
Love your neighbor as yourself. Love someone else as much as you love yourself. That is what you were supposed to be doing. You were supposed to love God, love him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And they would have been like, yeah, that makes sense. But love somebody else almost more than you love yourself. And they would have been like, that doesn't make any sense. I, I, I love who I am. I mean, we are people who love ourselves. But Jesus says, I want you to think of someone else as more important than you. I want you to think of them as just that you love them so very much that you just, you, you can't, you, you just give them everything that you have. You think of them first. You're not thinking about yourself first anymore. You're thinking about loving God and how you can help others. And somehow in the middle, God will take care of the rest, meaning God will take care of you. And the Pharisees would have been like, this doesn't make any sense to us. Why would God want us to do that? And I think the reason why Jesus breaks it down this way is A, I think he wanted to to make them a little bit angry because they were a people who took care of themselves. They took what God made to be good and they used it to serve themselves. And Jesus took a moment to say, I see what you are doing. I see the mistakes that you're making. I see the problem with how it is that you're interpreting my Father in Heaven's law. And what I need you to know is that God wants you to love Him. And when you love Him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, something happens in you that you love others more than yourself. And it begins to change how it is that you interact with them and how it is that you interact with God. And so it continues on. It says, all the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. And so essentially Jesus says, listen, all the law that we have talked about, all the law that you you have, everything flows from this idea. Love God, love others. Love God, love others. Love God, love others. And what Jesus is saying is, is, all the things that you have learned in scripture have to go through these filters. No that you're not always going to be perfect. Know that you are going to make some mistakes. Know that there will be some struggles. But your job is to simply love. Love God, love others. And I think there's one more thing that hangs at the end here. He said, uh, so uh, what I need you guys to do is remember that you will never get everything perfect. Parents, Jesus says, and scripture, the Pharisees are saying, there's all these rules, there's all these things that you have to be thinking of, that you have to know, that you have to understand. And Jesus said, listen, knowing is only part of the battle. Knowing is only just a small thing. And I think we should, as parents and as leaders and as people, gain as much knowledge and understanding of our youth or whatever it is that you're interested in, but for, for the sake of this series, to know and understand the ins and outs of our kids. It's our job to do that. But know that you are not always going to be perfect at it. There are no perfect parents in this room. There aren't. There just simply isn't. And you're not going to get it perfect. But the, the response that Jesus gave to this, the people is the same response that I think he's giving to us when it comes to raising our children. Though we will never be perfect, if we do it in love, it begins to change everything. And so there's two steps to finish out this whole series. Two things that I think are so important for us to remember. The first thing is this. Make sure every story, principle, and truth that you talk to your kids about reinforces what it means to love God and to love others. Parents, you are gonna make a ton of mistakes, but if your mistakes are uh, focused on doing your best to help them to understand who God is and how he intersects with their lives and how he's a vital role and how uh, what you do reinforces that God loves them and loves others and he's called us to love him and to love others, I think it sets our kids up to understand that God loves them in spite of any flaw that they have, in spite of any mistake that they face, that God loves them uh, deep. And I think we just need to pause for a moment and and realize that. There's a reason why in the book of John, John 3.16, the verse that Tim Tebow wrote, just kidding, Tim Tebow didn't write that. In John 3.16 where it says, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that who shall ever believe in him will not die but have eternal life. The reason why God inspired John to write that. It's because the central theme of of God's message to his people, to you and I, his children, is love. And some of us today might be saying, that is just too simple. Sure, but if things get complicated, we're not the smartest of people and we kind of mess things up. And so God says, I want to make this so simple for you. Parents, church people, believers, love God. Love. 
Jesus came to die for you because God loved you as his children. So our response should be very similar, that we should love our children. We should love the children who aren't even ours, but are part of this church. We should love them with all we have. We need to reinforce that God loves them and God loves others. God loves us, and so because of that love, and as we love him, we are to love others. And the last thing is this. Uh, Yeah, Andy Stanley says this, and I love this. Spirituality is determined by how well one loves, not how much one knows. And I love that, because I don't know everything. And though I'm a pastor and I I do this for a living, I don't know all the answers. I don't have all the answers. And some of you are parents, and I have a lot to learn from you. Some of you just know a lot of things. But the thing is, is that spirituality, growing our kids to knowing and naming their faith, helping them to understand that God has played a role and that their faith is important, isn't based upon how much you know. And the biggest reason that Jamie will tell you and I'll tell you from just asking people, the biggest reason why people do not volunteer to help in children's ministry or youth ministry is simply because they say, I do not know enough. I don't know enough about scripture. I don't know enough about God. I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing. I don't know what stage of life they're going through. And the thing is, is that is almost the least important thing to kids. It's important that you know who God is and don't, don't, uh, don't misunderstand that but they are looking for you to love them first. It's the old adage. They don't care about how much you know, and so they know about how much you care. And so here's the challenge. Here's the challenge. I want to challenge you all to say, how in my own life as a grandparent, as an aunt or uncle, as a mom and dad, how can I step up in the life of my kids? How can I be more intentional about teaching them what it means to love, uh, to love God and to love others? But as a church, as people who come here, what can I do? What can I do to get involved into a young person's life? What can I do to be involved in growing this next generation, to helping them to understand that we see them and that they are valuable and that they're important? What can I give? What can I sacrifice? What can I show for them that I love them and who they are and I believe that God has something better for them? I believe that they can be world changers. What would it look like for you to step up so they don't step out? What would it look like for you to say, you know what, I will give this amount of time during my week so that I can help influence the next generation? Because if you're honest with yourselves, if you're honest with yourselves, if you think about those people who played a big important role for you, they were people who sacrificed something to talk to you. They were people who sacrificed time, energy, and uh, moments with their family or work to, to, to pour into you, to give you something that maybe you didn't even deserve. And so how foolish would it be if we were a people who wouldn't reciprocate that, who wouldn't do that as someone has done for us? And most importantly, Jesus, who died on a cross for us, that God gave his one and only son for us so that we could experience life. What would it look like for you to sacrifice something so that you give to this next generation so they can experience the life that comes from the Heavenly Father through Jesus Christ? That is our responsibility. That is our job. And we don't have to do this but we get to do this. And my hope is, is that in the next few weeks, we start seeing people who sign up for helping at youth group. We start seeing people who sign up helping at children's youth ministry. We see people involved in, in, in uh, vacation uh, Bible school. We see people signing up for Sunday school in the morning to be a part of kids' lives. We see uh, people just getting together and to celebrate together the importance of young, this young generation, but the importance that the older generation has for them. Because the older generation, you were equally as important and you are equally of, of value. And it's so good that our generations get to learn from you how it is to love God. Remember, we get to do this. We don't have to. So let's just step up so they don't step out. Would you pray with me? Father God, thank you so much for who you are. Thank you for your love and for your grace. And God, we often miss it. We often overlook it. And so our prayer is that you would help us to have eyes to see and ears to hear and a faith to believe that you are a God who is so intentional, who cares so deeply, and who, who loves so intimately, that you would help us to be willing to give something of ourselves so that we can help influence this next generation. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.